Hi, I'm Brian Hickson, Neuroscience Director for the Brain Performance Center. And today we're going to talk real quick about treating ADD and ADHD without medication. And I want to get started on this. We have people joining right now, but we're going to go ahead and get started and they can join as we go. So, all right. And this is going to be available for, uh, it's going to be recorded. So it will be on our website if anybody wants to look at later or pass it on to someone else. So one of the big things that we got to talk about when we talk about ADD and ADHD is the problem with that diagnosis is it's very vague. It's all based on symptoms. It's not based on physiology. Um, I always say, you know, having a, a diagnosis of attention deficit would be like going to an orthopedic surgeon, telling them all about the pain in your back. And then when you turn this way, when you do this, it hurts here and hurts there. And then writing down a bunch of notes and say, okay, I've got it. Your diagnosis is pain. And we would probably fire that doctor based on that. So the problem with attention deficit, again, it's based on a bunch of symptoms. And if I took 10 people and lined them up all with attention deficit, they'd probably all have different physiology. So we have to understand the physiology that is causing the symptoms, just like that orthopedic surgeon would probably say, you have a hernia disc between L3 and L4 causing your pain, which is what we'd want to know because we fix the disc, we fix the pain. And same thing with attention deficit, we need to understand what is the physiology causing it. Now, before we jump into the different types of physiology that can cause it, let's start by giving just a quick overview of the regions of the brain that, especially as they um, pertain to attention. I think that's super important to start with. So we got all these different regions of the brain here and each region does a different function. Okay. So it's important to know that and know how that is, that region is functioning on each person. So this prefrontal, this left prefrontal, this is going to be mainly attention, planning, organization, has a lot to do with impulse control, reward evaluation, things like that. But really, this is the frontal area that's going to hold my attention. It really de decides what's my priority of my attention. So we've got this area here that can control attention. Then we have this left area, which we're going to see is basically the same as this right area and these temporal lobes that control things like memory and emotional regulation. A lot of people say, why is emotional regulation important to attention? My attention is going to be based or filtered by my emotional regulation. If I'm in a urgent type, threat type state or feeling something could happen, my attention is going to be on different things. It'll be very hard to hold my attention on something very kind of boring and present versus when I'm very relaxed, I might be able to do that a lot more. So emotional regulation has a lot to do with attention. Okay. And definitely memory does too. And then we're going to talk here about this left parietal portion of the brain. That really has to do with reading comprehension. This is all our verbal processing. Um, it has a lot to do with visual processing in the back of the brain, right behind that area too. But verbal uh, processing right here and visual kind of right behind it. And so all in this region right here. So that area is very important for lists of words, remembering things, putting things together, understanding sentences, remembering what you read, all those. And then we've got this area here, which is a sensory integration area. Now, the sensory integration area is where all of your senses come into the brain and process. So it's our sensory processing. This is very important, too, because not only are we paying attention to what we're maybe focusing on, but our body's paying attention to everything around us and all those senses, all that inputs coming into the brain and bombarding the brain. So if we feel pain, if we feel uncomfortable, if we feel itching, any of those things, it's going to distract us. So we have to look at sensory integration and how that's working as well. And then we've got the area over here of visual spatial processing come on the right back part of the brain. Um, again, that's going to visual spatial is also our ability to turn things around in our kind of mind's eye and our brain rotate objects, uh, be able to read things when they're kind of flipped around and stuff too. even look at geometric shapes and pay attention to objects and things as well. So this visual processing is very important. And then again, we've got memory, emotional regulation on both sides here. And then we've got nonverbal in this right frontal portion of the brain, right frontal prefrontal portion. We've got this nonverbal processing and social cues. So it's paying attention to people around us. Um, do we, you know, are we, are we, all these nonverbal cues, you know, during the pandemic, I think most people realized that when you were maybe ordering food or something and you had, a, someone had a mask on 
and, and it's very difficult to understand them. Um, it wasn't because the volume was too low. That little bit of mass doesn't block the volume of it. But the thing is that our brain in a conversation, my right side of my brain is always reading the nonverbal cues, but it's reading things even like lips. It's reading, is that person paying attention? Do they care? Are they looking the other way? Are they mad? Are they tired? Are they bored of my conversation? That left side is reading the actual or listening to the actual words they say and getting my words back to them. But both of those sides go together. So when you block off portions of that nonverbal, it makes it very difficult to even pay attention to someone or to understand what they're saying. Um, and then we've got the last part here, which is more the executive functioning area. Okay, and task switching. So this kind of this area kind of controls all the rest. It puts it all together. Executive functions aren't one portion of the brain. It's really the integration of multiple portions of the brain. It's the integration of processing speed with attention, with memory, all these things together. And also things like visual processing, sensory integration, being able to control all those things. What is the most important thing for me to pay attention to? And uh, and so this area kind of causes that. Task switching is, again, being able to go over here and then to over here and over here. You know, a lot of OCD, uh, uh, um, you know, things that, that where we get just obsessive and compulsive against things or on things it, it we lose the ability to task switch so we get so compulsive or obsessed onto one thing it's hard to switch back and forth so what we want again is for all of these to be working well now what i'm going to talk about next is very important because each of those areas that's what they do that's the function of those areas but now we have brain waves okay now brain waves are really just the electrical activity that fires away it's almost like the rpms in your car it makes the car go the faster the RPMs, right? Because the, the tires are rotating faster and the engine's rotating faster. And then it comes down to an idle when you're not going, right? So those things are very important. It makes it go, it makes it not go. Same thing with neurons. Neurons, the faster they fire off, can actually speed up a portion of the brain and it functions more. And then they need to come back down to a resting state and come to a nice idle, okay? So if, a, if the neurons in a certain area are idling too fast, that would be like your car idling way too fast when it stopped. If an area is idling too fast in the brain, that part of the brain's staying on. It's staying going. It's not coming back down to this resting state. What we measure with EEG, and it's so important to understand, again, the physiology, we have to look at the brain. Anytime we're trying to diagnose the brain, look at things in the brain without actually getting an image of the brain and seeing what's the function of the brain, we are purely just guessing. We have to look at the brain. And when we do, we can see areas of the brain that when at rest are staying way too high and they're over-processing, which we're going to talk about in a minute, what can cause that. And then there's areas of the brain that might be under-processing. That'd be like your car engine idling way too low. Or think about like a heart rate way too low even when you're just at rest or having a heart rate way too high. We want that in a nice idle in every region of the brain when you're not doing anything. And then it can turn on and then come and turn off. We don't want it to get stuck. So let's talk about kind of how that looks when it gets stuck. So again, I'll start here on this left side, the attention planning area. So if this gets stuck over firing, it's firing too much, then what can happen is that, first of all, it can wear out very quickly. You know, it'd be like holding a muscle flexed, you know, two hours into your day, you're already exhausted. So it can exhaust that area, but it can also make you to where you pay attention. It's your brain's going so fast and overworking. It's hard to pay attention to boring things. Your brain is firing away too many thoughts, too many, um, too much attention to different things. It's hard to, at that point, it's really a, an attentional control issue that it causes. It's not really attention deficit. It's actually too much attention. It's, and that's where if you give someone like maybe a kid a video game that has lots of stimulus, they can pay attention to that all day long. But if you give them something that's low and their brain's going way up here, they have a hard time, very, very difficult time paying attention, being present. They have to have a lot of stimulus in order to match that. So again, if their brain's going too high in this area, it requires a bunch of stimulus. Without that, the brain gets bored so quick, it loses dopamine very quick, it dumps dopamine, and it can't even maintain that attention for very long. So, you know, this is can cause really a problem when it's overactivated as an attentional control issue. I can't even control my attention. On this side, that memory side, again, it's too much when the when the brain is overactive, the brain tends to only care about encoding memories on things that are more urgent, things that are more a threat, more that I have to get done, 
there again there's a lot of urgency um if you're if you're trying to get something done and there's an urgent deadline um your brain naturally will produce faster brain waves under more stress and when it's under more stress it will start not remembering the unimportant and only remembering things that are urgent to do with what you're doing right now. So if someone's always in this state of a little bit of urgency, we can forget the quick little things like where I set my keys, where I put my phone. Um, you walk by your kid and ask him to do something and their brain's already stuck thinking about something else and they didn't even encode what you said or you tell them to go you know to your room get this do this do this and they do the first one and they can't remember what the second one was again too high causes a dysregulation not only does it wear out again faster but it makes it very difficult uh, to remember and again that's part of the emotional regulation because when they're in an urgent state their brains in more of a stress state it will be very difficult for them to be present enough to understand what's being said. And even in school, this is the case. The brain will go to all these other things, be thinking about thoughts inside and when they're stressed and have a little more anxiety. And it's really hard to pay attention to something that doesn't, the brain doesn't feel as urgent and doesn't seem as, it doesn't feel it's as important right now. Um, and then the reading comprehension here, this area, if that part of the brain stuck way too high, it can throw off reading. The brain's going too fast to slow down and pay attention to the words and understand it's thinking about other things as you're trying to read and it doesn't encode anything. That's the person that has to reread things three times to even understand what they just read. And then we've got sensory integration, sensory processing. And again, if that's too high, it's over processing how I feel, my muscle sense, my nerve sense. I can feel uncomfortable more. I can feel, you know, these are the, the kids, especially young kids that, you know, if their socks not on perfect, it's bugging them and they can't even concentrate on something else because they're they're so focused on that little bit of sock hitting against their foot or you know we see kids all the time that you know pants have a hard time on them or but even things like you know where they have to move a lot and stuff too all those things are sensory integration and without movement it makes it very difficult they need when your brain is firing up here your activity or behavior needs to come up to that it's hard to keep your behavior still when your brain's firing this fast it will keep pulling it up to that. So if my portion of my brain, that central portion of the brain there that's requiring, you know, motor activity, sensory input, and I'm not giving it anything, your reflexes will start. That's where you start getting these kids with ticks and different things that start happening automatic. It's a reflex to basically, you know, bring that, that activity up to where the brain is. And then we've got visual processing here over here, visual spatial. So if that's going fast, hard, you know, it's, it's hard to kind of, um, you know, twist things around in your mind or see shapes and understand patterns. Uh, big, big part of processing and attention and even IQ is pattern recognition. Pattern recognition is how we focus on different things. It's how we read all these things. And this is all that visual spatial has a lot to do with pattern recognition. We kind of already talked about memory and emotional control. So that can be over here too. And then we've got nonverbal processing. If this part of the brain is firing too fast, it can pay attention too much to nonverbal cues and not listen to what someone said. This would be a person that if someone's tone of voice is a little bit off or a little bit high, or maybe just a little bit that what they sense is a little bit of angry, they don't even know what you just said. They just know that someone's mad at them. Or, you know, that even if you weren't mad, it can, you know, read into things too much. So this is very important to calm down so we can pay attention to the literal thing that people are saying and not pay so much attention to all the social interactions that they're doing. We want to pay enough attention, but not too much. And then we've got executive functions. When this is too high, again, it causes more OCD type behavior. Um, if we, we lose our ability to task switch, um, becomes obsessive, compulsive, and it makes executive functions start to fail. So you can see all these areas, we can see in a brain map, if areas are too high or too low um, activity and start to understand what is the actual functional problem in the brain versus just saying things like attention deficit. Every one of these areas, these regions of the brain, if they start getting off, can start causing attention deficit. And we have to be looking at the physiology to really understand that. Okay. So next, what I'm going to do is talk about a little bit. This is kind of what a brain map looks like. And you can understand things are like the reds would be way too high of activity. Blues would be way too low. We compare this to a standardized normative control database of someone's same age and gender. So we already know where the neurotypical is. And we can see again, if there's over-processing or under-processing. And uh, so here's some of the ways that we treat attention deficit. Um, 
with non-medication. Um, but, you know, again, it all depends. The problem with saying that like this supplement helps attention deficit is that it will help like magnesium, our first one here, magnesium will help if they have high activity and have a magnesium deficiency, which again, we can see in a brain map. But if they don't have that, magnesium will not help them at all. So we can't just start saying, oh, this supplement helps with attention deficit. Oh, if you do this, it helps with attention deficit. It depends on where that person's starting point is. And if they have too low of activity, too high of activity, there's a lot of things that influence it, even as like sleep waves. Typically, when we do a brain map, we're also looking at their whole sleep waves, digestive system, gut side, nutritional side, all these things together to really understand how the brain is managing um, its activity and its function. But again, just to go through a few things, depending on what we see, if it's too high activity, diffuse across the whole brain, that means there's cellular activity, something that's, that's affecting the cells across the whole brain. That's where we might look at magnesium deficiency. Magnesium regulates calcium. Now, this red means that these portions, this whole brain is firing away neurons way too fast. Neurons cannot fire away without fuel. That fuel that actually is coming in through the calcium ion channel of that neuron is calcium. Calcium shooting in through there and causing these sparks of electricity to shoot up through there, okay? Firing away all these neurons. So we don't want to get rid of calcium in someone's diet. You need calcium. But magnesium attaches to the outside of the calcium ion channel and opens the channel and closes it. So it regulates it. It's like the fuel injector in your car. So as you need more calcium, it opens up, lets calcium in. And as you need less electricity and less calcium, it shuts it down. So it regulates it. So sometimes when people have had diffuse all the way across for a long time, the, all those fuel channels are wide open, sucking as much calcium as it can, firing away the brain into this hyperactive state all the time. And so magnesium can start to shut some of that down. Now, just taking magnesium by itself is a little bit like a garden hose on a forest fire. It's not going to change huge amounts. Um, sometimes if it's a little bit high, it can cause it and can bring it down. So we can see some, some uh, improvements with a, a good amount of magnesium. Um, we have to be careful on magnesium not to cause too much of a laxative effect because it can flush through the digestive system. So there's different forms of magnesium that, uh, that we can take that will help not do that, but still get absorbed by the brain. Again, that's good if we have diffuse high activity. The other thing that can cause that is neuroinflammation. And one of the biggest things of neuroinflammation, the causes of neuroinflammation is high omega-6-3 to rate ratio. So omega-6s that we get from corn, soy, vegetable oil, things like that are highly inflammatory. Okay, they, they cause inflammatory reaction in your immune system. Omega-3s are anti-inflammatory, okay, which you get from fish mainly. Fish, um, fish oil is really the only thing that has the omega-3s, the EPA and DHA that we need that crosses the blood, blood brain barrier. Um, a lot of plant-based omega-3s do not. There are some um, from algae that has EPA and DHA that can cross the blood-brain barrier that is a vegan source. Um, but most of the time, it's going to be from uh, fish oil. So again, omega-3s are anti-inflammatory. Omega-6s are inflammatory. We want a balance between those two. Optimal would be a one-to-one -one balance in the membrane of all your neurons in your cell. One-to-one -one would keep inflammation perfectly in check. You need inflammation at times, but you don't want it going off all the time. Okay, so one-to-one -one balance is perfect. The average American has 25 omega-6s to every one omega-3. So now you're in a such a highly um, inflammatory state all the time that little bits of things can trigger huge amounts of inflammation. Those are usually the people that are very sensitive to things like gluten, things like lactose, things like dairy. Um, you know, all these things can just cause a little bit of stress and it triggers too much because they're already in an inflammatory state. So again, higher amounts of omega-3s can balance that out. Lower amounts of omega-6s can balance that out. Um, again, we can see all these things in a brain now. So it makes it nice before we go changing our whole diet and changing everything, especially with our kids, which is very difficult. I'm a parent. I understand that. I know that you can't just change everything, especially if we're guessing. But if we know that that's the activity and we know that we need to do that, then if we do it, we know it's going to work. Um, so omega-3 to 6 ratio is very important. Uh, poor sleep cycles. That deep sleep cycle is what detoxes the brain. Um, so many kids are not getting the proper sleep. Um, low heart rate variability. Again, what we want is good heart rate variability, which basically means that the, the your breathing is influencing your heart rate. Okay, Typically, 
if you're in more of a stress state, the the basal ganglia in the, in the limbic system is regulating your heart rate. It's actually making your heart rate be exactly the same every single time. Whereas when it's lower activity, when you're not stressed, the only thing that changes your heart rate is your breathing. When you breathe in, your heart beats a little bit faster. When you breathe out, it breathes a little bit slower. So we see this variability in the heart rate, which is what we want. And that's just a good indicator of lower stress. And there's a lot of breathing techniques and stuff that we can teach to be able to control that and get that heart variability um, a lot higher um, so that we're lowering the stress and being able to gain control of our heart rate which then allows the brain to relax. Stress interferes with so much. If it's diffuse low activity, again, it can be just an omega-3 deficiency. Omega-3s are to the brain what, what a protein is to muscles. So we have to make sure we have enough. They're what 30 to 40% of the brain is made of. Um, these fatty acids here, omega-3 fatty acids. Um, MTHFR. Um, MTHFR is a genetic variant that uh, many people have it. Um, and if you do have it, you can have different degrees of it. Um, but if you do have say one copy of it, you have about 40% less methylation that happens inside your cells. Now, really just to kind of break this down, when you eat things like vegetables, they have vitamin B in it. And that vitamin B has to break down into, um, ATP, which is the, the fuel source in your cells. And it has to go through a methylation process when it does that in your cells to break it down into the energy component. And people with MTHFR do not break that down very well. They don't methylate that vitamin B and break it down into the energy in the cells. So if someone has that, they would typically have a lot of low activity across the brain. And we gotta make sure we get them on methylfolate or a methyl B12. I usually like a full methyl B complex typically. Um, but you know, we can send you out to get a, a genetic test and stuff for that too, if we see activity like that to verify it. Um, excess cell palmitic acid. Uh, palmitic acid comes from eating things with high glucose. So glucose uh, with sugars, when we eat a lot of sugar, if we are not burning that sugar off, if we're running a marathon and we're eating sugar, it burns it off as energy. But if you're sitting in a movie theater and you're eating a bunch of candy, it is not burning it off. It's actually converting to palmitic acid, um, it hits your liver and converts to palmitic acid. And when it does that, that palmitic acid starts getting stored into the membranes of the cells and it starts kicking out the omega-3 fatty acids. So it kicks out the nice conductive parts that make the, the brain work and it slows it down with basically all this toxic fat in there um, that causes real problems. And then it starts causing problems with leptin uh, response, which is what makes you feel uh, like you're full. Um, it lowers the leptin response. It then starts to even lower some insulin responses. That's why high amounts of palmitic acid, which again comes from sugars, can cause eventually even some pre-diabetic and diabetic issues because it dysregulates the insulin. Um, but again, that excess palmitic acid at the very least kicks out the omega-3s. And then you're left with this very, not a very conductive cell, not producing very much electricity. Um, that would produce this low activity. Uh, glutamate deficiency, we produce more glutamate, which is an excitatory neurotransmitter when we run, when we get some aerobic exercise. We need to make sure we're getting enough aerobic exercise, at least probably 20 minutes, three times a week to be able to get enough, produce enough glutamate so we can think properly. A lot of kids that have no aerobic exercise, they're not having enough glutamate, which is again, the excitatory neurotransmitter. If you ever get a chance, there's a book called Spark. Uh, by a Harvard professor that documents this school outside of Chicago that implemented all of this um, aerobic exercise all through their day. And they took their scores, which were just average in the U.S., and the U.S. is about number 15 or 20 in the world. And, you know, with Singapore and Japan, everything being way up on top, especially in science and math. And this school district, old school district, took their scores of the kids that did this up to the same levels as I think it was the number one and number three in science and math um, in the world, um, just through exercise. I cannot tell you how important exercise, aerobic exercise is for our kids, but even for adults too, we have to do it. They produce it produces glutamate. It produces something called BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which is a growth factor on the brain, actually grows, initiates stem cell development or stem cell growth. So it grows new cells, but it, at the very least, it actually initiates glutamate, which is the primary excitatory neurotransmitter that we need 
to be able to learn and understand things and make new connections. So super important there. If there's very focal activity down here, meaning it's not diffuse across the whole brain, it's very focal. A lot of times this is from concussions, little tiny concussions, little falls, even little whiplashes, falls on the playground and stuff too for kids and sports and stuff too. They can fall on their tailbone and get a little concussion. Again, it doesn't have the brain. It, it, concussion occurs when the inside of the brain slams against the inside of the skull. Okay, You don't have to hit your head against anything. A whiplash can cause just as much concussion as slamming your head into the ground. So, you know, little things can cause little focal areas to be off. And that's where we really have to use something like um, EG neurofeedback, where we can place a sensor right on that area and actually train it. Um, but it's so important, again, to have these personalized interventions based on the physiology, not only going off symptoms. I think that really probably the psychology and psychiatry markets, the mental health markets or, or mental health, even medical specialty is probably the only specialty, only medical specialty that diagnoses and treats based on symptoms and not by imaging the brain and understanding what's going on. So I can't emphasize enough how important it is to have personalized interventions based on each person's physiology. You know, when people come into us, I don't care that they have attention deficit. I look at their brain and understand what physiology in there is causing that, not just generalized things, but half the time it's a visual processing issue in the back of the brain that makes it hard to hold attention. Or it could be a working memory area, or it could be a sensory processing area, or it could be just a language area in that left parietal area that has a hard time with reading comprehension. We can see a lot of times it's a sleep issue where they're not getting the quality of sleep, so they're not getting the recovery, they're not detoxifying the brain, and it's causing that. So there's so many things that can cause it. And uh, you know, this is an example of what the neurofeedback looks like, where we can place a sensor directly on one area of the brain. This is like physical therapy for the brain. So we can place a sensor on one area of the brain, we put it through a computer and look at all the different brain waves that are underneath there, and we can actually make a video game go forward or stop based on your brain activity. So your brain is controlling the game. When your brain goes more into a focus state and holds the focus, the game goes forward and the smoke comes out here and it moves forward through here. We have all kinds of different games, car race games and stuff too. And whenever your brain goes to a non-focus state to where it's more distracted or anything, the game comes to a stop. So we're using video games now to help build and strengthen the focus networks of the brain, which is amazing how you can rewire the brain. You can make focus area is stronger. You can reduce stress on the brain that's that's getting in the way of focus or getting in the way of your ability to hold your attention. So again, once we see some of these areas in the brain, we can actually train them to be better. And again, this becomes a long lasting effect because once you normalize that, your brain can hold it and then you start using it every single day. And uh, actually, the American Academy of Pediatrics has given neurofeedback a level one, the highest level of support equal to stimulant medication for attention and hyperactivity behaviors, but with no known side effects and more permanent results. Medication, you go on it, it may help for a little bit, but then you go off of it and it goes back down. So very, very important to, again, if I could just stress, look at the brain first. Without looking at the brain, we're just guessing. All right, thank you very much.